So I, I am not going to talk about anatomy and physiology because that one hour session will not be sufficient. Just uh, localization in the spinal cord, I will do. Okay. Many people have asked about uh, something on dementia. From next week, I am doing two, three sessions on dementia. That is what I have planned. Yes, you, Dr. Kishan sent me that message. So before that, this one presentation is a very common topic. I thought I'll do. So, okay. so we'll see. Uh, the what spinal cord symptoms? Somebody is coming with the symptom of the spinal cord. So what are why this picture is there in the middle? How to do? What I should do for that? Both of our pictures are there in the middle of the PPT. You can push it out. Uh, you can push it out. Now. Yes, I push it. Yes. Okay. So the uh, somebody is coming with the weakness of one leg, two legs. Um, three three limbs or four limbs, that is a spinal cord symptom. So it can come from vertebra, ligaments, meninges covering the spinal cord, arteries, veins, and their unique features, and myelin, uh, and related disorders, vascular supply to the spinal cord, or it can be degeneration, and it can be, or it can be a disease which is selectively involving some tracks and sometimes you can have false localization. So very important to recognize because in human beings, as we all know, spinal cord is only serving as a transmitting pathway, not very functional like lawyer animals, but the transmission is very, very vital. It is between the brain and the peripheral organs. And if the transmission fails, everything fails. As such, de novo, unique function of spinal cord in humans is not like animals. In animals, there is a lot of functions for themselves, writing reflexes and so many things, but human beings, it is less. But the transmission is very vital. And if the transmitter fails, uh, patient is going to have a uh, disaster. So it's important to know what is causing that symptom so that we give the appropriate treatment without a delay to the patient. So next. So how do we, somebody, somebody comes with a um, symptom that I told it may be one leg or two legs or two legs and one hand or both hands and both legs and some associated symptoms and you think it is a spinal cord problem, then we, it is categorized into pan cord syndrome where we have got ascending tracts, descending tracts and in the axial sections, anterior consul, crossing fibers, all these are there. Everything is involved means it is a pan cord syndrome. Anterior cord syndrome, if the patient has got the involvement of everything other than posterior column. Posterior cord syndrome, if only the posterior columns are involved and anterior parts are not involved. Hemicord syndrome, if structures in one half of the spinal cord are involved. And central cord syndrome, if the central structures of the spinal cord is involved. And tractopathy, if only one tract is getting involved. So this is after having seen a person with the feature suggestive of a spinal cord symptom. And after we examine, we categorize them into uh, these six categories, pan cord, anterior cord, posterior cord, hemicord, central cord, and tractopathy. Then what is causing that is the most important thing. For undergraduate and MD students, and of course for DM students also, one important mimic, I told that uh, false localizing, so weakness of limbs of this order can be cerebral also. If we miss it, we may completely fail to investigate that area and that results in a lot of uh, delay in diagnosis. So what is the difference between cerebral paraplegia and spinal paraplegia? We'll start like that. So after excluding only all these pan cord and all comes. So cerebral paraplegia, features of raised intracranial pressure may be there because it is Fox uh, region tumors, vascular anomalies in that region, the, those are the causes, so, or even venous infox in that area. So if there is a raised intracranial yeah. pressure, you know that it is a, uh, some cerebral pathology. Yeah, back to Usually in spinal paraplegia, raised intracranial pressure is not there, but occasionally it can be there. And lower limb onset seizure. In the inner hemispheric region, the lesion is there only, it starts as paraplegia, yeah. so the common colors. And the loyal in patient may have seizures. Yeah. But then if you are pointing the pathology to the spinal cord, we may think that seizure is clonus. 
So how to differentiate clona? Clona comes on stretch only. So the limb has to be stretched either by patient planting the feet on the floor. And it will never come spontaneously. And it usually distal, it doesn't mark. Whereas lower limb onset seizures are spontaneous, they have a march. They do not need a stretch. So that is your casually, if you are seeing some movement, okay, this person is having paraplegia and he's having a clonus. You will think like that. So it is not so. So second is where upper level. In a cerebral paraplegia, the upper level will be ill-defined and vague. Where in a spinal cord lesion, the usually we get a good level. And in the cerebral paraplegia, sensory impairment in the lower limbs is cortical sensation. And it is usually asymmetrical. Whereas in spinal cord, it is somatic sensation, that is pain, touch, temperature, like that. And in a cortical paraplegia, patient has got a frontal type of bladder. That is his bladder control sensation, everything is all right. But social cognition is not there. So he will pass urine anywhere he likes. In all forbidden places, he'll pass urine. Well, in spinal cord, it is either automatic bladder, partial pyramidal bladder like precipitancy, hesitancy, or depending on the level, it may be autonomous bladder also. Then in cerebral paraplegia, paraplegia in flexion never occurs. Whereas if the spinal cord lesion is a pan cord syndrome, patient will go into paraplegia and flexion. So when somebody is in paraplegia and flexion, there is no need to ask that question. Is my patient having a cerebral paraplegia? Should I investigate the brain also? So it never occurs in cerebral paraplegia. And behavioral changes can be there in cerebral paraplegia. It never happens in spinal paraplegia. So these are the points to differentiate. So why this is happening? You know that this is the inner hemispheric fissure. This is the motor homunculus. This is a sensory homunculus. Motor homunculus below the hip itself is in the interhemispheric region, whereas sensory homunculus, it is below the uh, mid leg. So it will look like a distal sensory loss. So we will think it is spinal cord plus peripheral nerve. So go and examine, you will find reflexes of preserved and sensory loss is cortical and all other features I told. So it is uh, how you differentiate the cerebral pie. Very often missed, even though it's not very common, it is there. And when it is there, mostly it is missed. So first to rule out the cerebral paraplegia before we decide it is spinal. Now we will see what is that pan cord syndromes. All pathways are disrupted. The ascending pathways, the descending pathways, all are disrupted. Then it is pan cord syndrome. Now above the level of the lesion, patient has no deficit. At the level of the lesion, there can be a thin area of lower motor neuron involvement. There can be a band of hyperesthesia patient can have root pains at that level. And below the level of lesion, there is upper motor neuron features with loss of all sensations. Sensory loss is usually few segments below the level of involvement because sensory fibers ascend and the lowest segments are more superficial and vulnerable in spinal thalamic pathways. Because of that, there is slight false localization. Sensory impairment will be little few segments below when we examine. So that is pan cord syndrome. Uh, so, the, so what is this paraplegia and extension and paraplegia and flexion? So we just saw how to differentiate cerebral paraplegia from spinal. Then what is pan cord? That is what we are going on now. All the structures are involved. At the level, there can be element with the hyperalgesia yeah? below complete loss of everything. Then what is this paraplegia and extension? After the period of shock is over, hypertonic, hyperreflexic weakness will happen once the shock period is over. And we know that there are so many tracks. Among that, we have got dorsal reticulospinal tract, medial and lateral vestibulospinal tract, which belong to the spinal extrapyramidal system. These fibers are most resistant to damage. So we, even in a pan cord syndrome, these fibers may be retained to some extent. These are concerned with maintenance of extensor tone. So what happens? The limb remains with the extension in the hip and extension in the knee. So that is called paraplegia and extension. That means the spinal extrapyramidal systems are still not damaged. It is a, a very good, it's of prognostic relevance. 
A patient with paraplegia in extension can be rehabilitated to a relatively better quality than a patient with paraplegia in flexion. So paraplegia in extension happens when the patients have not damaged completely the spinal extrapyramidal system, which is resistant, least uh, uh, sensitive to destruction and the last track to be get destroyed. And this is good to prognostic it. After the acute phase is over, patient can be rehabilitated better if he is having paraplegia and extension. What is this paraplegia and flexion? After the acute shock is over, if the patient's spinal extrapyramidal tracts are also destroyed, patient goes to flexion of the hip, flexion of the knee, and dorsiflexion of the ankle. So the, how this is happening? We all know that when the child is born, child is having flexion at the hip, flexion at the knee, and trunk is bent, and the palm is kept in the chin. This is to occupy minimum space inside the uterus. And this is a reflex posture. This is not voluntary, because at that stage of development, child has uh, only spinal stage. There is brainstem and cortical stage comes later. So this is maintained by structures called short latency flexor reflex occurrence. When every tract in the spinal cord is destroyed, the short latency flexor reflex afferents, which are inhibited when the child progresses from the spinal stage to the brainstem stage, become disinhibited. So child goes, patient goes into the reflex posture of spinal stage of uh, intrauterine life due to disinhibition of the short latency flexor reflex afferents which are intersegmental reflexes, which have no need for higher centers. They are for minimum space inside the uterus, and it's a protective crawling when everything is damaged in the adult. So that is paraplegia and flexion, very difficult to nurse, very difficult to rehabilitate. That is of worst prognostic relevance. Next, in an acute cord, uh, pan cord transection, there is a phenomenon called shock. So what is this shock? So on survival from a severe spinal cord injury, patient will go through three stages. And this is due to sudden loss of corticospinal information transfer to the spinal cord. The cause, we said that spinal cord is a transmitting structure. So brain will give information and this information should be carried by the spinal cord to the periphery. So now here is a situation where the brain is not giving any order. So spinal cord does not know what it has to do. At that time, it becomes completely dysfunctional. That is spinal shock. And it can be three uh, phases of recovery. One is the stage of spinal shock. Second is the stage of reflex activity. And third is the end stage when the reflexes also fail and patient goes into complications. So what is this spinal shock? It occurs uh, immediately after injury. Injury means not necessarily trauma. It can be necrotizing myelitis, demyelination, all those conditions, anything which causes a pan cord syndrome. And all muscles are completely paralyzed. There is complete loss of muscle tone. So it is flaccid. And loss of all types of sensation. And there is loss of reflexes. There is paralysis of the bladder and bowel. And because these autonomic fibers are there, thoracolumbar outflow is there, and these fibers also become disinhibited. There is severe BP fluctuations, and there are bed sores, that is shock. So three to four weeks, this can last, and later the patient will start recovering depending on whatever tracts are not damaged. Next is the stage of reflex activity. Activity of affected tissues gradually return. So everything is paralyzed now. Then whatever is functional gradually begins to recover. And smooth muscles regain their tone. So this results in bladder retention. Initially, both the body of the bladder and the sphincters are uh, damaged, non-functional, not damaged. Because of that, what happens? Uh, the patient will be continuously dribbling. Afterwards, the sphincters recover, so goes into retention. And because this thoracolumbar uh, sympathetic outflow is disinhibited, <laughs> you know, thoracolumbar outflow, 
<laughs> receives information from the hypothalamus and based on that only it carries out uh, its activity. But when it is disconnected, it is also autonomously functioning, so resulting in a fluctuating blood pressure and skeletal muscles regain tone <coughs> and paraplegia and flexion initially with the exaggerated tendon reflexes. They can have periodic emptying of urine and motion uh, with flexion withdrawal that is called mass reflex. This is a second phase after shock. What is the third phase? Recovery pattern after shock. If the uh, lesion is not total, within 24 hours, sensation starts recovering. So sensations recover earlier than motor. So after the period of shock, after 24 hours, if the patient says that some sensation is there, that means it is a form. Now the destruction is not total. Then leg fluxors and adductors recover earlier than abductors and extensors. Knee jerk recovers earlier than angle jerk. <coughs> so at that time, when the angle jerk is absent, we may think that there is a radical of the It is not so. <coughs> It is shock recovery pattern. And sphincters recover earlier than bladder wall or bowel wall, so they go into retention. Heat-induced sweating is reduced, but reflex sweating is increased. That is thermoregulatory sweating. In the region that is affected, thermoregulatory sweating is reduced. But spontaneous sweating can happen because of the disinhibited autonomic tracts. But above the level of lesion, to maintain thermoregulation, thermoregulatory sweating will be more than normal. So this is the uh, second phase, that's the recovery phase. <clears throat> and at this phase, if the patient has uh, had severe damage and he has not been treated for even the treatable uh, complications like infections, he goes into severe infection, urinary infection, sepsis, uh, and then reflex, and uh, all reflexes become, uh, again, goes into contractures. And uh, there is uh, usually, eventually, they die due to severe infection. That is uh, Pancard syndrome, acute phase and recovery phase. Then there are other reflexes uh, associated with this uh, Pancard syndrome, apart from the acute shock syndrome. What is mass reflex and autonomic dysreflexia? Mass reflex is seen in pan cord pathology, that is spontaneous defecation and urination, sweating and scratching the inner thigh in patients with complete cord lesion. We know, we have, in the previous some sessions when you have discussed, we know that bladder bowel information is carried through the spinal cord to the brainstem centers, then to the cortical centers, and through loops called Bradley's loops. There is multiple levels of control of bladder bowel function for learned social behavior as well as voluntary control over bladder and bowel. When the spinal cord is disconnected, that voluntary control is lost. So whenever there is a slight stimulus, patient cannot get orders from the cortical areas. So there is automatic emptying with the severe sweating, and this is called mass reflex. Uh, so that is one kind of thing which happens in Pancard syndrome. Second thing is autonomic dysreflexia. What is that? So uh, as we uh, saw, thoracolumbar outflow is sympathetic outflow. So this sympathetic fibers get communication from the hypothalamus. When that is disconnected, this becomes disinhibited. Like the short latency flexor reflex sufferance disinhibited, patient goes into flexion. Autonomic functions are disreflected. So patient goes into autonomic dysreflexia. So what is that? This can be a potentially life-threatening because gross fluctuations in blood pressure. So it occurs in spinal cord injury where the thoracolumbar outflow is preserved. It is not damaged. If the thoracolumbar outflow is retained and its connection with the hypothalamus is lost, the thoracolumbar sympathetic fibers start acting on their own. So what happens is, um, the, when the sympathetics are retained, 
there is vasoconstriction and hypertension. So the, the uh, in response to this hypertension and vasoconstriction, cerebral baroreceptors react and produce reflex bradycardia. So unique combination of severe hypertension, bradycardia, and vas due to vaso other features of vasoconstriction like cold limbs, all those things can be there. And this, uh, this syndrome is called autonomic dysreflexia. This indicates thoracolumbar autonomic fibers are not destroyed in the spinal cord disease, but they are uh, disconnected from the higher centers. So because of this blood pressure fluctuation, they get headache, sweating, and piloerection uh, above the level of the lesion. They can have seizures. They can develop cerebral hemorrhage. They can develop hypertensive encephalopathy, myocardial infarction, and death due to the severe autonomic fluctuations. So we have to inform that to the patient. Otherwise, they will think that they came with a spinal cord disease. After treatment, so many other things happen like that. They will imagine. So this picture depicts what is happening. This is the, imagine the, this is the spinal cord lesion, pan cord, where the autonomic fibers are retained here. They are disinhibited from the higher control. So what happens? They become automatically functional and they produce vasoconstriction and hypertension. This is perceived by the central baroreceptors and reflexively it produces uh, bradycardia. So this is autonomic dysreflexia. <coughs> Next is, if the lesion is involving higher uh, cord, the, uh, it, if it is involving upper thoracic region and injury interrupts the thoracic sympathetic outflow. The previous uh, autonomic dysreflexia, thoracic sympathetic outflow is preserved. If the thoracic sympathetic outflow is uh, damaged, this causes loss of vasomotor tone and cardiac sympathetic control is lost. <coughs> this results in hypotension. and bradycardia, whereas autonomic dysreflexia, it is hypertension and bradycardia, whereas neurogenic shock is hypotension and bradycardia due to destruction of the sympathetic fibers. The blood pressure to be restored by use of inotropes like dobutamine, process like dopamine, but uh, the recovery depends on completeness of the damage to the sympathetic. And we can use muscarinic antagonists like atropine to treat bradycardia, but unless the neurological insult is partial, these patients also carry a very bad problems. So three things, one is the spinal shock. In Pancard syndrome, spinal shock is there, mass reflex is there, autonomic dysreflex is there, neurogenic shock, if the sympathetics are damaged, as well as you have got paraplegian extension and paraplegian flexion, that is about Pancard syndrome. Next is the partial cord syndromes. This is an axial section through the spinal cord. All of us know that this is the posterior column. Here the upper limb fibers are outer, sacral fibers are inner. And in the uh, corticospinal tract and in the spinothalamic tract, it is the reverse. The upper limb fibers are inner and the sacral fibers are outer. The, so that we have to remember. And this is... Uh, this much is supplied by the posterior spinal artery. Rest of this is supplied by the antispinal artery. So these are uh, going to help us localize what is causing the partial cord syndrome. Com most important is hemisectioning of the spinal cord. This is called as brown sick cord syndrome. And this happens commonly due to injury, gunshot injuries in the war. But sometimes it can happen due to tumors, or even infarction of the arterial corona, and sometimes it can be demyelination also. So above the level of the lesion, there is no deficit. At the level of the lesion, like pan cord, at that side, there can be lower motor neuron features and normal motor functions on the opposite. On the same side, there is pyramidal involvement, posterior column involvement, and pain and temperature is retained because they are crossing. And pain and temperature and crude touch is involved on the opposite side. So, ipsilateral pyramidal posterior column, 
contralateral pain temperature and uh, crude touch. And there can be a brand of hyperesthesia on the same side at the highest level. And there can be mild motor paralysis on the opposite side due to anterior corticospinal tract involvement. At this point, in the Pancard syndrome, I told to remember about the cerebral paraplegia. Here, unilateral sensory symptoms, pain and temperature can sometimes happen in lateral medullary syndrome. So we are thinking of a brown sequard syndrome. We have investigated and we find nothing. Then you may have to go up. It may be a partial lateral medullary syndrome. That is called a pseudo-spinal presentation. Because if there is a partial involvement of the spinothalamic tracts in the medulla, the sacral fibers and the lumbar fibers are lateral. And the cervical thoracic fibers are mean. So when there is a partial lateral medullary syndrome, it can mimic a brown sequard syndrome. So that we have to remember, patient is having pain and temperature in the leg alone, and we are not finding anything in the spinal cord, investigate the lateral medulla. And sometimes the parietal lobe lesions can also mimic uh, by producing this sensory features. So this is the spinothalamic tract, whereby lamination, the sacral and lumbar fibers are outside. When there's a partial lateral medullary syndrome, these fibers get disrupted and patient can present with pain and temperature impairment in the legs. So that is uh, brown sequard syndrome. Now let us see what is anterior cord syndrome. These are two posterior spinal arteries. This is anterior spinal artery. So anterior spinal artery territory getting damaged is anterior cord syndrome. So other than the posterior column, everything else gets involved. So anterior cord syndrome, usually vascular, secondary to flexion injury. So there is impairment in the pain and temperature and motor depth is below the level of injury and it is usually symmetrical. <laughs> posterior cord syndromes, it is less often vascular. Two posterior spinal arteries are there, and uh, the, it is uh, having participation with the pile plexus. So the posterior cord spinal artery involvement is less common. So usually posterior cord syndrome is partial, and it is due to lesions like uh, demyelination or tumor, in the posterior column. <clears throat> Let's often vascular. Unlike anterior cord syndrome, which is most often vascular, posterior cord syndrome is usually not vascular. It is due to intrinsic pathology and they are asymmetrical because even if it is vascular, two posterior spinal arteries are there. So unless both are simultaneously involved, it cannot be symmetrical. So it is usually asymmetrical and usually not vascular. Usually other conditions like MS, tumors, and neurodegeneration. Only posterior column is involved. Now let us just see what is post spinal cord ischemia. It forms 8% of myelopathies, but most often missed. So because we think it is demyelination. Uh, spinal strokes, they are often missed. So anterior spinal artery involvement can produce owl sign. That is hyperintensity in the anterior horn cells on both sides in the T2 weighted images, looking like the owl side. Posterior spinal artery involvement can produce posterior spinal, uh, posterior lateral signal changes. And venous infarctions produce diffuse hyperintensity. And it is, um, what is the clue then? One, respecting the vascular territory, that is one clue. Second clue will be in the appropriate vertebra also getting. Uh, abnormal signal changes because the vertebral artery uh, branches to the vertebra are also shared by these spinal arteries. So look at the corresponding vertebra, you find hyperintensities in the vertebral body. That is a clue that this patient's spinal cord disease may be ischemia. <clears throat> Next, we will come to the central cord. So hemicord, anterior cord, posterior cord we control. Now you are coming to the central cord. So this is otherwise called spinal man in the barrel. If you want to put somebody into the barrel, upper limbs are the problem. So upper limbs have to be made weak. Then only you can put him into the barrel. This can be a cerebral man in the barrel when there is a watershed infarction right. between the MC and the ACA territory. The upper limb fibers are there. 
severe hypotension due to MI or diarrheal disease, then they develop weakness of both upper limbs. Second man in the barrel is antifonsal disease, bibrachial atrophy and lower limbs are spastic. And the central cord is final man in the barrel syndrome. So bilateral upper extremity weakness with preserved fascia, but some leg movement may be preserved. And they can be uh, mild impairment of bowel and bladder. And recovery usually starts in the legs and gradually progresses upwards. This is happening in hyperextension injuries. <clears throat> As you know, uh, in the corticospinal tract, the upper limb fibers are most medial. And uh, so these um, structures which are centrally placed get affected early. So upper limb weakness more than the lower limb weakness. Bladder fibers are close to the midline. So mild bladder bowel involvement. So that is uh, central cord syndrome or spinal ma man in the barrel syndrome. <clears throat> then we'll see what is uh, venous pathology. Mm. So chronic, chronic venous hypertension due to various causes, dural arterial venous fistula. What happens? The venous uh, hypertension is there due to the fistulous communication that can result in necrotizing myelo myelopathy that is called foix salajuanin syndrome. Uh, it, is pro it presents as a symmetrical weakness. Sensory and autonomic disturbances will be there and uh, they are uh, very difficult to uh, clinically diagnose unless you take into account the uh, other situations. Patient may have uh, trauma to the spine in the past. If trauma is the commonest cause for AV fistula. Or very luckily, if it is a congenital one, you might find a bruise. So otherwise, it is very difficult to suspect. It is a radiological diagnosis by the flow voids and the bag of worm appearance. <clears throat> and one interesting presentation of this venous lesion is thought bands gravitational paraplegia. If this arteriovenous malformation slowly leads because um, they have low pressure system and it slowly leaks and blood accumulates from below upwards. So it's a gravitational paraplegia. On the initial presentation, the weakness may be like cardiac vena. Then when the blood keeps on tickling, it becomes coronas. Then it goes to the lumbar thoracic. So that is called thought bands gravitational paraplegia. That is one presentation of venous vision. Second is multiple small leaks produce aseptic arachnoiditis. The venous lesions can present uh, with necrotizing myelopathy, gravitational paraplegia, or aseptic arachnoiditis. And in decompression sickness, when the patient goes into diving, it is, it is actually a venous lesion to the spinal cord that produces paralysis. It is due to uh, nitrogen bubbles getting into the venous system and impairing with the venous drainage. <clears throat> so we saw the arterial as well as the venous lesions of the spinal cord. So now we are, we are going one by one. We, are, we have seen three of them, patterns as clue, cerebral paraplegia versus spinal paraplegia, paraplegia and extension versus flexion, what is spinal shock, all this we have covered, and the arterial pattern, hemicord pattern, venous pattern, central cord pattern. Now other patterns are ESET pattern, cruciate weakness, Ellsberg phenomena, jolly sign, broad burn sign, and beaver sign, inverted radial reflex, Cervical paraplegia, myeloradiculopathy, cardiac vena, coronas, cardo. So these are some patterns which help us to diagnose each one of them. Myeloradiculopathy is very common. That's the commonest presentation. Patient has got myelopathy and the radiculopathy at the upper level. It is an extradural extramedullary compression. Cervical paraplegia in, non, in situations like uniform compression, like cervical canal stenosis. The leg fibers are outside. So the leg fibers become weak early. So it can be paraplegia, but the pathology is in the cervical region. They are the commonest presentation. Others, what are they? We'll see. These three we have covered. <clears throat> Iset pattern is element weakness of one upper limb, then the element weakness of the next upper limb, then EMN weakness of the starting lower limb side, then opposite lower limb. So this is called Iset pattern. This happens in foramen magnum level cord compression by end block lesions, soft lesions like end block meningioma, lipoma, neurofibromas. <clears throat> that is very typical because instead of compressing, they are soft lesions. 
instead of compression, they uh, uh, produce a carpeting like effect. So they carpet the region, they go round instead of compressing and displacing until very late. So the descent pattern is very typical of high cervical cord foramen magnum lesion compression. <clears throat> what is this bell screw shaped hemiplegia? So spastic weakness of ipsilateral lower limb and contralateral upper limb. That is called bell screw shaped hemiplegia. And this happens again in the foramen magnum region. At the foramen magnum, the lower limb fibers are more distal than the upper limb fibers. And so uh, because of this lesion, the ipsilateral lower limb fibers gets affected and upper limb the fibers which have already crossed are getting involved. So this is the well cruciate hemiplegia in foramen magnum high cervical cord lesion. Then this depicts the picture where the uh, corticospinal tract for the lower limbs are uh, crossed and coming ipsilaterally and upper limb fibers are higher and going the opposite side, those fibers get involved. So mm -hmm. it is the side of lower limb weakness that is the side of pathology, that is Wells cruciate hemiplegia and foramen magnum lesion. Then <clears throat> we saw the central cord. So central cord uh, syndrome, upper limbs are weaker than the, we already saw it, uh, upper limbs are weaker than the lower limb because the upper limb fibers are medial in the corticospinal tract. And deflexes are depressed at the upper level because the ventral horns are there, anterior horn cells are there at that level. Because it is central bladder is there. Commonly it is whiplash injury. So central cord syndrome is whiplash injury, dynamic spinal cord injury. You are running, getting down from a uh, running bus. There is hyper extension followed by flexion. That is central cord. <clears throat> what is Ellsberg phenomena? So in cervical cord compressive lesion, presenting as weakness of one upper limb, but that is upper motor neuron. Unlike the set pattern in foramen magnum, it is lower motor neuron. Weakness of one upper limb, upper motor neuron, then lower limb, then opposite lower limb, then opposite upper limb. This is called Ellsberg phenomena. All are human. Explained pathology starting being vascular. <laughs> Sulcocommissional arteries which supply the medial pyramidal fibers are end arteries. So if the lesion starts like that, Ellsberg phenomena occurs so that the initial symptom is not due to compression but due to infarction. So seen in extramedullary intradural compressive pathology, the problem is when you decompress, only the compressive thing will recover. Infarcted thing will not recover. So wherever the disease started, that limb is likely to recover very much less because it is infarction and not compression. That is Ellsberg phenomena. <clears throat> what is this inverted radial reflex? So tapping the radial side of the wrist normally elicits reflex contraction producing elbow flexion, wrist extension, and wrist radial deviation. Abnormal response of finger flexion when performing this maneuver without flexion and supination of the forearm. So finger flexion is more than elbow movement this is known as inverted radial reflex. There is depressed biceps jack and preserved triceps jack. This is typically seen in C5 root. So we saw for Raman Maginum, we saw the cruciate, Bell's cruciate hemiplegia, and now we are seeing the, we saw the Ellsberg pattern. Each one points to very useful clue for bedside diagnosis. An inverted radial reflex indicates a C5 root lesion. What is jolly sign and Bradburn sign? Upper arm is kept abducted, forearm is fluxed uh, and fluxed at the wrist and the fingers. This is pathology at C7. Because C7 is shoulder reduction, elbow extension, wrist extension, finger extension. So when that is damaged, opposite happens. Shoulder becomes abducted, forearm fluxed, flexion of the wrist and fingers. And if it is seen in one side, it is called jolly sign. If it is seen on both sides, it is called broadband sign. And beaver sign, all of us know, it indicates a D10 segmental pathology. Then what is this numb clumsy hand syndrome? We are knowing about clumsy hand syndrome in lacunar strokes, whereas in the spinal cord, second set of sulcocommissal arteries, 
Salcocomical arteries apply the medial pyramidal fibers, crossing spinothalamic and ventral horn. So when the salcocomical artery supplies the crossing spinothalamic tract is affected, patient develops numb hands. And there is that because of the numbness, the hand is clumsy. So numb, clumsy hand syndrome indicates the salcocomical artery supplying the spinothalamic tract getting involved. If it is acute, it is vascular, chronic, it can happen in conditions like syringomyelia. What is this spinal syncope? So lesions above the T5 can cause vasomotor instability. We saw the autonomic dysreflexia. Because of that, they can have pastoral syncope. If it is not part of an acute pancord syndrome, it's a partial cord syndrome, but the lesion is above T5 and autonomic dysreflexia becomes the first symptom, they can present a syncope. So when the patient has been investigated with the heart, heart and other systems for neurological cause for syncope, all those is over, then do not forget a rare situation where there is a lesion in the spinal cord which can produce syncope. So you can, <coughs> so you can ask for sweating, hypertension, flushing, headache, bradycardia, but all that can be attributed to your cardiovascular problem. So if all those things are excluded, remember a uh, lesion about T5, which can also cause a spinal syncope. <clears throat> so that uh, we have covered some of the important features based on what is pan cord, hemicord, central cord, uh, anterior cord, posterior cord. Now let us see when a patient comes with a spinal cord pathology, what is intrinsic, extrinsic? Extrinsic means pathology is coming from the vertebra or the roots uh, or the meninges. Intrinsic means it is involved in the tracts themselves. So well, when do you think my patient is having a spinal glioma or he is having a spinooptic MS? So crossing spinothalamic tracts, they are never getting involved in a extrinsic pathology coming from the vertebra or cord or root. So if there is a Crossing spinothalamic, that's a numb hand, numb clumsy hand syndrome. So the crossing spinothalamic tract is involved, it is intrinsic. Autonomic involvement is there, it is intrinsic. Anterior horn cells are there, it is in intrinsic. And selective tracts <coughs> and sacral sparing, because the sacral fibers in the spinothalamic tract are outer sacral sparing. So these are points indicating intrinsic. Extrinsic means additional involvement of the bones cord and the roots in a patient with spinal cord involvement that indicates extrinsic. <clears throat> Next we'll see what is the etiology. Is it compressive? If it is compressive, extradural, intradural, intramedullary, non-compressive, demyelination, degeneration, vascular, toxic, nutrition, metabolic. So from that angle, how are you going to make a spinal cord localization? So compressive versus non-compressive. It is not the acute non-compressive like transverse mild. It's a chronic non-compressive syndrome. So the duration is usually long. They do not have any gibbous or pain or tenderness. The upper level is generally very vague. Bladder comes very late. <coughs> and you can have distant signs like optic atrophy, gyrate optic atrophy, deafness, or peripheral neuropathy, which is part of the non-compressive pathology. Whereas in compression, there is no distant signs and bladder comes very late. So in compressive lesion, short duration, there can be gibbous and pain, definite upper level, early bladder and fluxus spasms are common. So this is another kind of localization, uh, cost-based. <coughs> then what is extradural? What is intradural? Extradural vertebra, usually vertebra. So gibbous, paraspinal muscle spasm. Symmetrical because vertebra is in the midline. Root signs because roots are getting jammed in the foramen. So root signs are common. You just examine, you find a depressed bicep chair. And ascending pattern of sensations. And if it is in the lower cord, SLR uh, may be positive. Whereas intradural gibbous is not there. Paraspinal spasms are not there. Usually asymmetrical. Root pains are more common because in the intradural space, the root is floating over a longer area. So when there is a disc or any tumor, it will get touched and irritated, but it doesn't get jammed like getting jammed in the foramen. So root pains are more than signs. Sensations start distally and go up. 
bladder is lit and SLR is negative. What is intramedullary? Intramedullary is different from intrinsic. Intrinsic means lesions affecting specific tract, corticospinal tract, posterior column, patchy lesions. Intramedullary means lesions starting intrinsically around the central canal. So they have tract pains because the tracts like crossing spinothalamic tract, they get involved. So tract pains, not root pains. SLR negative. Sacral sensory fibers are lateral in the spinothalamic tract and therefore there is sacral sparing and trophic changes are early and depressed reflexes at the level of, at the top level. There can be wasting and autonomic involvement. Classical example is syringomyelia. So that is intramedullary. Lesions around the central canal, that is intramedullary. Intrinsic means intrinsic within a tract, that is intrinsic. Next, what is cardiac vena? Roots below L3, if they are involved, it is called cardiac vena. It presents with asymmetrical because the roots are flailed out. In the cardiac vena, it is like a harsh tail. It's not in one place. It's all flailed out. So it is asymmetrical. It is a lower motor neuron, therefore atrophic. If it is lower motor neuron, therefore areflexic. Because of the asymmetry, late bladder. It can be purely motor or purely sensory also because the sensory and the motor roots join together in the foramen. In the cardiogenic region, the cord stops at L1 vertebra. And these roots travel longer distance to enter their appropriate foramen. So the motor and the sensory roots remain separate for a longer distance. So it can be purely motor, can be purely sensory. It can be air, uh, and asymmetrical atrophic air reflex. Then what is this corners and epiconus? So segments. It is UMN. Segments below L, uh, segments below S3 is uh, corners and L3 to S3 is epiconus. So segments below S3. So it is upper motor neuron. It is usually symmetrical. It's a very small area. So because it is concerned with the sacral uh, bladder, bowel, and sexual function, limbs are not much affected. So these patients are described as walking, leaking patients. They have relatively less limb weakness, but bladder, bowel, and sexual functions are more affected. Unlike the intramedular lesion where there is sacral sparing, here there is sacral anesthesia. Mild symmetrical upper motor neuron signs may be demonstrable. What happens is bowel, sexual functions, and bladder dysfunction. What are the types of bladder you can get in a spinal cord lesion? Depending on the level, it may be automatic, autonomous, Sensory denervated, hesitancy and precipitancy. Sexual functions, you know that you have got both sympathetic and parasympathetic or supplying and sacral parasympathetic through the pelvic nerves help in erection <coughs> and thoracolumbar sympathetic through the hypogastric nerves are adjoined in erection and somatic nerve is podundal nerve and descending cortical fibers through the lateral column cause psychogenic erection. And lesion above D12, therefore, invades the psychogenic erection because the cortical descending fibers are not there. Whereas the corners, whereas uh, uh, this is preserved, sacral parasympathetic is there, so they can have uh, reflex erection. When the corners lesion, both are invaded. So, because these fibers are uh, disconnected from the cortical connection. And ejaculatory failure occurs in, uh, when there is a lesion in the thoracolumbar region. The red earrings, remember harness. You can have a harness, so we need not go to the hypothalamic region or the uh, orbital uh, apex and things like that. Harness can happen in CAD1 root lesion. Papilledema. Papilledema necessarily does not mean a brain lesion. Freud syndrome, when the CSF protein is very high due to protein secreting tumors, then there can be a papilledema in a spinal cord pathology. Optic atrophy can be seen with degenerative spinal cord disease or demyelinating diseases or hyperammonia syndrome where gyrate optic atrophy. So they should not uh, make us think that the lesion is not involved in the spinal cord. Lower cranial palsy seen in foramen magnum lesion. Balaclava helmet pattern, craniovertebral junction lesion. Seventh and fifth and quindothalamic tract can happen in Arnold's theory malformations. Phrenic nerve gets involved in high cervical pathology. So patient will present with respiratory abnormality. 
then apparent glove and stocking can happen due to posterior column involvement when you examine the reflexes are retained and there are uh, only posterior column not peripheral nerve involvement then you can have tractopathy that is the last thing we saw about various uh, anterior posterior pan cord hemicord central cord and individual tract lesion they are called tractopathies so posterior column can be involved spinal thalamic alone pyramidal tract alone spinal cerebellar tract alone and the horncell and spinal lesion this can be individually involved so this is selectivity so demyelination prefers the most myelinated tract so if there is a tractopathy of the posterior column and the corticospinal tract the pathology is probably demyelination vascular lesions prefer to involve the spinothalamic tract and the autonomic toxins prefer the spinothalamic and the spare the autonomic with some exceptions and subacute combined degeneration this is a unique and very common tractopathy posterior column and corticospinal tract get specifically involved in betel deficiency hiv disease copper deficiency tabis dasalis pseudo tabis and belmont's posterior column ataxia involve only the posterior column degenerations like hsp and leukodystrophy involve the corticospinal tract motor neuron disease involves the anterior horncell and the corticospinal tract in a posterior column another common infection neurosyphilis posterior column and the root entry zones there is loss of pain vibration and position senses they can have sensory ataxia they have lermit sign and uh, lightning pains and other posterior column features pseudo tabis can happen in diabetes and belmont's posterior column ataxia then uh, as i have told these tracts in vasculitis these are uh, i have already uh, mentioned these things so there are various diseases um posterior column and corticospinal demyelination spino optic ms nmo spectrum disorder secondary demyelination these are individual diseases by themselves so the aim of this presentation is just to know how to localize and use localization as a, a clue in diagnosis so next i will do next wednesday because some uh, students have asked about uh, dementia so uh, i have written a book on human cognition as we understand today that's a big book with the complete indian uh, literature covering almost all the areas in cognition uh, yeah, i will start from next wednesday cognition three four sessions i will give a broad view if anybody is interested in my book you can contact uh, uh, dr raman uh, uh, that will help uh, to understand the, uh, when expand i cannot cover everything as you all know we have some students have asked me to uh, have, have give them some sessions on dementia so i just informed if anybody is interested you can contact us thank you thank you so much madam thank you and yes. lot of uh, students have found this section useful like a lot of uh, recommends on youtube as well for all these sessions uh, like and personally also many messages you have got saying uh, how useful the sessions have been so thank you so one one Any question answer, i shall answer yes ma'am so one question uh, um, can you please elaborate on hydromelia versus syringomelia you see hydromelia syringomelia is usually eccentric uh, it is a Uh, asymmetrical intramedullary lesion hydromelia is usually a fusiform dilatation of the central canal it, so it is not eccentric so it is asymptomatic for a longer period the crossing spinothalamic involvement all those things may not be there instead patient present with bladder bowel dysfunction so hydromelia is fusiform dilatation of the central canal whereas syringomelia is eccentric dilatation of the central canal any other question one more question is can headache present as a manifestation of seizure disorder yes definitely they are called cephalgic seizures they uh, so they come abruptly is relatively less common but these are called cephalgic seizures they come abruptly they stop abrupt, abruptly but other features of seizures may not be there eeg will show dysrhythmia so it is called cephalgic seizures 
and they usually respond to anticonvulsants. Even otherwise, the migraine headaches we treat with valproate, lamotrigine, those group of drugs. But seizure can present a headache when it is it is doesn't have the buildup. It comes suddenly, lasts for some time and goes away. And there can be used EEG correlates. Any other question? One more question in the wash, like uh, revision of what you have told. Uh, can you please uh, different, uh, tell how to differentiate between automatic, autonomous and frontal bladder? You see, frontal bladder, pre phase is normal because the sacral centers all are all right. Only the frontal connection is not there. So pre phase is all right. Patient appreciates fullness, patient appreciates sensation, everything. And if he wants, he can initiate maturation. He can empty completely. There is no dysenergia. But uh, there is something called learned social behavior. So even when the bladder sensation started, when we are in a social gathering, we can hold on the bladder with the help of the frontal loop up to 1.5 to 2 liters. So patient will look for a convenient place and empty. Whereas in the frontal lobe disease or a frontal bladder, when he feels the sensation, he forgets the learned social behavior and passes urine in inappropriate places. He empties completely. He feels the sensations. Urodynamic studies are normal. And you ask him, why did he do that? He will say, what is wrong? It is my house. That is frontal bladder. Automatic bladder is sacral center is preserved. So normally, the bladder wall receptors are there. And they have a very small capacity, the beta receptors in the body and alpha receptors in the sphincter make the bladder expand like a balloon. That is about 150 to 200 ml. After that, the bladder wall offer and carry the information to the sacral center. Sacral center has got about 300 to 350 ml control. Beyond that, it is the information is carried to the Barrington center, then to the higher cortical centers, and it will tell when to void. So sacral center is intact, but higher centers are not there. The capacity of the sacral center is about 300 to 350 ml. The automatic bladder is a situation where the spinal cord is transected above the sacral center. So patient pre voiding phase, because the afferent connection is not there, depending on completeness of the lesion, patient may have partial awareness of fullness and pain or total loss of awareness. Second, when the bladder uh, sacral centers are there, they carry the afferent information. Partially, after reaching, they cannot go up to the cortical centers. So they come back. So patient does not up, uh, have voluntary. They have to go to the cortex and then get the information to tell this place is appropriate or not appropriate so that patient can voluntarily inhibit or facilitate maturation. But this is not possible you know, because the fibers cannot go to the cortex as they are transected. So patient has no voluntary control over initiation or emptying. So sensation may be partially or completely lost depending on the completeness of the spine cord pathology. Patient has no voluntary control over initiation because he's not getting the higher information due to failure of the information transfer to the cortex. So spontaneously, when the capacity of the sacral center is reached, that is about 300 ml, there is reflex emptying. <coughs> So bladder starts emptying periodically, reflexly, with no voluntary control. And when there is a reflex emptying, there is emptying of about 300 ml. It's a good quality emptying. After that, when the capacity to the bladder wall receptor is coming, the sphincter will close. So there is a large residual urine. And there is dysenergia. Because of that, after a period of time, patient develops urinary infection and reflex. So automatic bladder is one when there is partial or complete impairment of sensation in the pre voiding phase based on the completeness of the pathology. As the information is not going to the cortex, patient can neither initiate nor control initiation of maturation. Because the sacral center is there, there is automatic emptying of a good amount of urine, about 300 ml. And at the end of the 300 ml emptying, the bladder wall receptors take over. So that capacity doesn't get emptied because there is dysenergia. So there is a large residual urine. 
and this residual urine leads to reflux and later complications. That is automatic bladder. Autonomous bladder is even the sacral center is not there. Only the bladder wall centers are there. So the bladder wall centers are beta receptors in the body and alpha in the sphincters. So the beta receptors keep on expanding the body and the alpha receptors keep the sphincters closed uh, till it reaches the point of rupture of the bladder. So it's a large bladder and when there is no sensation at all. So autonomous bladder, patient has no bladder sensation. He cannot initiate maturation. There's a large bladder. There is no reflex emptying at all like automatic bladder. But the weight of the urine after 1.5 to 2 liters mechanically opens the internal sphincter, so it dribbles. So unlike automatic bladder, there is a reflex emptying of about 300 ml. That is not there. And uh, it's a large bladder. Automatic bladder is a small bladder. Autonomous bladder is a large bladder. Automatic bladder, partial sensation may be there. Autonomous bladder, nothing is there. And automatic bladder, intermittently, there is a good quality emptying. Autonomous bladder, there is only dribbling. So these are the, here the sacral center is also destroyed. Only the bladder wall centers are there. Am I clear?